Boston was never a city of kings or conquerors. The city's tallest building long bore the name of a smuggler, John Hancock. By the 19th century, Boston was trumpeting its intellectual ambitions as the Athens of America. But all that learning was built on the wealth of a solid mercantile base. During the 20th century, America started to see the rise of consumer cities, places like Los Angeles or Miami, that grew because people wanted to live there, not because firms had any particular reason to choose that spot. In a sense, Boston was America's first consumer city. The colonists who came to Massachusetts during the 1620s and to Boston after 1630 were motivated by lifestyle choices more than economics. They wanted to live in a Puritan society where they would be free from persecution by English authorities and would, of course, be free to persecute others who didn't conform to their own godly ways. They wanted Boston to shine as a city upon a hill, as John Winthrop preached aboard the Arbella on his way to the city. I recognize that I'm displaying the standard economist reductionism by referring to the desire for eternal salvation as consumption, but, well, it certainly wasn't production. Boston had essentially no natural economic advantages except for access to abundant cod and some pretty great cranberry bogs. Consequently, the first few decades of Boston's existence were spent trying to find a sustainable economic model. For the Bostonians needed to import English manufactured goods. They needed guns, they needed Bibles, and they didn't have all that much that was worth shipping back across the Atlantic. Boston didn't have gold and silver deposits like the Spanish colonies of the South. New England's climate is a bit too much like the climate of Old England, which meant that Massachusetts couldn't grow crops like sugar that were valuable because they were rare back in Europe. In the early days, Boston and Massachusetts functioned as something like a colonial-era Ponzi scheme, which is appropriate enough since Ponzi himself was also a Bostonian. Each new wave of settlers brought with them a bit of gold. The old settlers then sold food and land to the new settlers and used the cash that was paid to then pay for English manufactured goods. But like all Ponzi schemes, this one couldn't go on forever, and immigration to Massachusetts slowed dramatically after 1640. The chaos of the English Civil War slowed the migration, and Cromwell's victory made it unnecessary to cross the fierce Atlantic to enjoy the pleasures of banning makeup and restricting Christmas celebrations. So Bostonians needed a new business model. They tried a number of different approaches. John Winthrop's son founded an ironworks that he hoped would provide a valuable export industry. It didn't. Boston's economic salvation came from hunger in Barbados. The Caribbean colonies were cash cows. Europeans would pay a fortune for their sugar. But the land became so valuable that it didn't pay to grow food there. By 1647, Winthrop had learned that Barbados planters were, and I quote, so intent upon planting sugar that they had rather buy food at very dear rates than produce it by labor. So infinite is the profit of sugar works. So starting in the 1640s, a triangular trade began. The more tropical colonies would ship sugar and tobacco back to Europe. Boston would ship basic commodities, fish, livestock, wood products to the southern colonies of the Americas. New Englanders would buy manufactured goods with the cash earned by selling to the sugar-producing regions. As late as 1770, 73% of New England's exports were going to the Caribbean and to the southern colonies. 35% of those exports were fish, 31% were livestock, and 21% was wood-related. Boston was one hub of that triangle, and also the triangular trade in slaves that developed simultaneously. For a century, Boston thrived as the preeminent trading hub of North America and the largest city in the English colonies, with 12,000 inhabitants in 1720. Boston's merchants were smart, and the city's sailors were skilled, but Boston had no natural lock on this export model. The cities of Philadelphia and New York were further south. They each enjoyed a better river network and a more fertile hinterland. Philadelphia's population surpassed that of Boston after 1740. Boston's mid-18th century economic doldrums led to some pretty ornery merchants, including John Hancock, who took particular umbrage at England's attempts to tax and limit their trade. Their unhappiness was one of the contributing factors that led to the American Revolution. But after that revolution, Boston soared once more, and once again its success reflected its stock of water-related human capital. The decades after 1790 were an era of early globalization. America was freed from trading restrictions, and merchants started buying bigger boats that were capable of sailing odysseys. They traveled to Canton in South Africa. They cruised for whales in the Pacific Ocean. Boston's slightly more northern location mattered less when the ships were traveling such long distances. Between 1790 and 1840, Boston's population increased from 18,000 to 90,000 and its economic strength was in the sea, not manufacturing. As late as 1840, Boston had 10,000 workers in the maritime trades and only 5,000 in manufacturing, which was less than neighboring Lowell, one center of Massachusetts textile industry. 
Boston still shows the legacy of its commercial strength during the era of sale. The wharves that still stand, most notably the Long Wharf itself, were the centers of commerce during that era. Small houses close to the port, like the still standing home of Paul Revere, were built so that their residents could walk to the wharves. The old State House, a site on Boston's Freedom Trail, once held a merchants' exchange and warehouses. State Street, which was once King Street, leads right from that building down to the wharf. The city's large Irish population is also a gift of Boston's dominance during the era of sale. Desperate immigrants could sail to Boston faster than they could to New York during the 1840s, and consequently Boston became a major port of entry for those who were fleeing the potato famine. When the era of sail was replaced by the era of steam, New York's maritime dominance became almost complete, and subsequent immigrants would come overwhelmingly to Ellis Island, not Boston. As a consequence, New York would become a dizzying ethnic mix, while Boston was still dominated by the divide between Irish and Yankee. Boston's merchants did many great things. They fought for liberty, which was so valuable for their financial livelihoods. They built the infrastructure, including rail lines, that would help Boston reinvent itself once again during the Industrial Era. They invested in colleges and universities. After World War II, those academic institutions, especially, I hate to admit, MIT, provided new entrepreneurial energy for the region. Boston may not have the great palaces or monuments of imperial cities like Vienna or Paris, but it remains a handsome city, displaying the wealth that its merchants earned by using their wits to trade with the world.